interesting. Good afternoon, everyone. This is the three o'clock session. We are here today with Oliver Jeffers and Roxanne Gay. This is How Art and Storytelling Shape Human Identity, a conversation with Oliver Jeffers and Roxanne Gay. Thank you. So I think we've been told to tell you that uh, the books by authors in this program can be purchased from Greenlight Bookstore outside on the plaza, and there's going to be some signings afterwards. There we go. Um, I think that nails it. That nails it, right? That's all the essential information you need to know. Um, you, you, everybody can hear us OK? Fantastic. Uh, so my name's Oliver. My name is Roxanne. And uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. <laughs> uh, we have met a couple of times and from very different backgrounds, um, uh, very different, uh, I think, experiences, but a very similar outlook on life, even though I think some people would see me in the, the, uh, the kind of books that we have both coming out as the glass half full and, and you more as the glass half empty, but I think that actually is not true at all. My glass is a lot more half empty sometimes and yours is a lot more half full than, than most people realize perhaps. I think so, but also the glass is just broken. <laughs> uh, and getting is more it half broken, broken every day. though? No, it's entirely fucking broken. <laughs> um, but you know, I think it's interesting when you write about the world as it is, people say you're a pessimist, but I tend to think of myself as a realist. And as I was reading Begin Again, I thought, well, this is a fairly optimistic outlook on life. And I know that one of the things you do in the narrative is really look at this idea of beginning again and starting anew. So when you say begin again, what do you mean by that? I think what I mean by that is we, we begin the story that we're telling ourselves again. And it, you know, there is a, a naive, possibly a fully naive optimism about this whole thing. But in, uh, when I was speaking on a, on a panel in Northern Ireland once about what the solution to the Northern Ireland problem would be, I have jokingly said collective amnesia. Um, and it, got me, it did get me thinking then when my, my son was born that, wait a minute, here is this completely unwritten story he has no idea of any of these things that he's going to inherit, both good and bad. And is it possible that we reframe the way in which we're dealing with the same information? So do we come at it with uh, an angle, I suppose, of it's not about individualism so much as it's about uh, co-creation or, or collaboration? Uh, and is it less about problems and more about solutions? So I think that's kind of what I mean by beginning again, just reframing the perspective of, our, of, of how we look at something. How do you reframe perspectives in a time when people are trying to erase the stories that are fundamental to the state of the world now? Yeah, that, and I think that is one of the most important things that has to be discussed. It's like the reframing the story does not mean erasing the story. Mm -hmm. And there, you know, there, we're dealing with a, the, I'm working on a project with the uh, Ulster Museum, which is one of the British museums. And we, whenever my wife and I were growing up, we used to go to this museum and there was a, a, a mummy, an Egyptian mummy there, and it terrified both of us as children. And my son's school was going to this museum and, and my wife Suzanne was joking, was like, oh, you know, there's this mummy, uh, be careful when you see it, it's terrifying looking. And he asked like, why is there a mummy in Belfast? And it was a question that never occurred to my wife and I. And so I was like, oh, that's a really good point. And the, so there's this entire conversation in the museum capacity at the minimum of decolonization. And they, you know, the, the ways in which they're looking at that are problematic in, in half the sense that like, well, you know, where would we return that mummy to, for example? Uh, but also then we don't want to return this work because there's not the context of somebody being able to look after it properly. And you know, maybe that big part of that, the conversation of decolonization is like, right, rather than just give it back, why don't you then set up that system that can look after that? Well, yes, but I also think, so, so what? Like, with the idea that the only people who know how to care for things properly being colonizers is um, 
fascinating. And you hear this conversation over and over in the museum world. Like we shouldn't send these artifacts back to where they come from because you know, they won't be properly cared for. And you don't know that. And also maybe that other culture has different traditions and care appears in different ways. Um, and I think that's one of the challenges when we talk about <coughs> stories. You know, we're working from a framework that was built on oppression. And when we talk about rethinking narrative and identity and all of these things, it's really much harder than it, you think because you have to really undo everything that you've learned throughout your life and start questioning, yeah. why do we do things this way? Why do you get to be the stewards of antiquity? Yeah. Why do you get to determine if yeah. you will do the right thing or not? Yeah. Uh, and you know, I'm just very interested in yeah. those questions. I, I, and so I heard it once said, some, uh, someone said that the hardest learning to do is unlearning. But I suppose one of the entry points that I have in is, you know, Frederick Douglass, who actually spent a lot of time in Ireland learning how to, to speak before he returned to the, to the USA, and we just erected a statue to him in Belfast. Um, but he, he said once that it's easier to build strong children than repair broken men. And I think, in a way, that's my entry point, is to, to possibly scatter some of these concepts in at a point where there isn't, the prejudice hasn't set in fully. Um, you know, the, the idea that uh, Mandela said that no child is born with hate in their heart, they have to learn that, and if they can learn that, they can be retaught to love. There, there is, I think that in beginning again with this book, I thought I was writing a book for adults, but the more that I've come around to it, it's like it's a book for all human beings, those who feel lost right now, but this, it's the platform, I think, to introduce some of these, these reasons, like why do people act a certain way? Why do people feel a certain way? And I, one of the, the things that we've talked about is that there is a lot of, frankly, straight white men who will never fully understand the privilege that they've had because it's just always been there and that context has just always been there. And so trying to reframe that with people that, like, you know, it's not my fault, da 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 da, it's like, Yes, but can you agree that the world is not exactly the way that we want it to be, and you play a role in this transition? And so, you know, they, my most optimistic spin I can put on, on that is that somebody like me and people uh, of my ilk, uh, you know, straight white men, can have a conversation with, the, with, with some of these people so that they don't go down the Andrew Tate direction. And it can be like, right, yes, not your specific fault, but you are a, a product of this, and you have to understand the role that you play in the pendulum swinging in this other direction. And that's just the, the tiny, tiny little modicum of hope that I have and optimism that I can put on that. I, that, you know, it, it's always interesting because I don't necessarily traffic in hope uh, <laughs> for so many reasons, but I always hope <laughs> that perhaps people can unlearn and ask themselves those hard questions and really do that sort of self-examination and recognize that self-examination and really acknowledging the past in order to move forward in a better way does not mean that you have to take responsibility for things you do not do. Uh, but I do think that one of the most challenging sticking points is taking responsibility for the ways in which you have benefited from systematic oppression and systemic oppression. Um, and I don't know that we have found the answer to that yet at all, especially when you look at what's happening with book bannings and the ways in which state legislatures are trying to reinvent curricula to elide things like the Holocaust and enslavement and you know, really anything that makes people uncomfortable. And, one of the things I try to think about in my writing and that I try to get at in the essays and opinions, most of which come from the Times and the Guardian, is really thinking about how we learn to live with discomfort. It's okay, we're not gonna die. I remember growing up when we didn't wanna do something, my mom was like, you're gonna live. And <laughs> <laughs> turns out she was right. Um, we're surviving. And so I'm very interested in the question of how do we learn to live with discomfort as we try to begin again and do things perhaps better and reach young people because there are plenty of problematic racist young people 
So there is certainly a point where we need to reach them, and I think it's well before we think. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. Now, just to, as a point of interest, I make books. I've made 20-some books, but I've never really written before because I can write with pictures. And so when I was coming to writing the essay at the back of this book, I asked Roxanne for some help. And you know, after tearing it apart and uh, tearing me apart and putting it back together, um, I learned a lot about the process of writing. But it, one, of the, one of the things that, that came up in it um, was, I suppose, one of the things that I like to try and do is translate, observe and translate things down into such a simple degree that they are not really about anything, but they're about the, the emotional core of, of a human being. And, and I, I do think that almost all the people I've ever met on an individual level are deep down fundamentally good people. And an important thing that I learned from watching uh, the way that my wife Suzanne interacts with our kids was that you'll never get anybody to change their mind by telling them that they're wrong. And it just it makes people double down in, in defense of these things. And so is there, are there other ways to go about this that require a little more empathy and a little more beauty, perhaps, and just uh, including them in part of a more interesting story, and you know, I wonder if 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 you think that, that is a, a reasonable approach. Well, yes. I mean, in an ideal world, I, I would. I think there are absolutely ways in which you can reach people without telling them that they're wrong. But I also don't think it's the worst thing in the world to tell people that they're wrong, because sometimes you're wrong. Yes, that's and absolutely true. So, I'm interested in how do we tell people that they're wrong without making that a, a condemnation of their entire being, like situating it, putting, providing context. And I think context is incredibly critical. Um, here's why you're wrong, but here's where you're right. You know, as a writing teacher, I'm always telling my students, you can't just hammer down on what's not working in a piece. You also need to talk about what's working. And it's constructive feedback. But I also think we can apply that idea of constructive feedback to the ways in which we engage with one another about creating change and about acknowledging where we go wrong. It's hard. I hate mm. being told I'm wrong because I'm always right. <laughs> um, I thought I was wrong once, but I was mistaken. I, yeah. wasn't, I wasn't wrong at all. Obviously, <laughs> yeah. you're wrong. But you know, the older I get, the more I recognize, yes, I can, get, I can be wrong. I am wrong mm. sometimes. And once I get through my feelings, which I process with my therapist, uh, or my wife, um, then I really just sort of ask myself, like, how did I get to that wrongness, and where do I go from here? And so I think that there can be grace and empathy and beauty in approaching it like that. I just know, especially as a black queer woman, for so long we have approached things with grace and empathy, and the world continues to demand that of us all the time. Every election cycle, black women are going to save the world, and it's like, mm -hmm. no, black women are going to save themselves, and the world yeah. is going to benefit. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we really have to understand where some people are coming from. I think some people can afford more grace and empathy than others. Yes, I. I couldn't have said that better myself. Uh, the, one of the ways that I was trying to frame it in the book is in trying to apply this to the situation in Northern Ireland where uh, individuals seem to continually go against their own best interests mm. by the, I suppose, the, the identity of one half of the cultures, uh, the one, one side of the, the group of people there, for both of them, two, two cultures, and they, the primary uh, thing, identifying thing about their identity is the existence of a perceived enemy. And so there is this, it's us and them, and if, if it's not us, it's them, or if they're, they think it's right, therefore it must be wrong. And Northern Ireland could be this, like geographically, it is a beautiful place, but it could be you know, this culturally important part of the entire world if we could figure out our political situation, but we don't. We keep voting in the same extremes every time. And in trying to work out why people keep doing that, I started to edge in on a question is like, can we get to a place where instead of saying right and wrong, we, we use the terms better and worse? Mm. And that, that is a line from the book where it's, uh, cause you know, being right is about proving the past, whereas by being better is building the future. Now that is idealistic, it's, there's gotta be somewhere in between there, but applying that to Northern Ireland, it will become very clear very quickly what the better thing to do would be. But still too many people prioritize being right. 
Do you think in the context of Northern Ireland and really many other cultures that are dealing with these centuries long sometimes fractures, if we point out that perhaps we have more existential questions than these issues that we're facing, these historical problems like climate change or well global warming, which is what it is, um, you know, I think about that a lot lately because, mm -hmm. you know, this is probably the first day we've seen. Hello? Oh, well. This is... Oh, well. Thank you. Maybe that one's working. This is probably the first day we've seen the sun in a very long time. <laughs> Many parts of Brooklyn and other parts of the city were underwater. This is happening with increasing frequency. The climate change that I think many of us growing up as, I'm a Gen Xer, we thought it was gonna happen generations away, so let's prepare and like make the world better for those generations. But turns out, we're the generation that has to make things better for not only the present, but the future. And I, I, I think we're at a really important moment now where I think as a humanity, we're gonna have to ask ourselves, are we gonna be able to work together, moving aside or moving beyond some of the issues that we're currently dealing with, not that we can't, not that we shouldn't resolve them, but like we can't resolve them until we have a stable planet That's to live it. upon. And, you know, when people say, "Is this a climate-related issue?" It's like, well, yes, everything is a climate-related issue because you need a climate for there to be anything. And I had the the opportunity to to make a sculpture at COP26 a couple of years ago to try and knock the, I suppose, the 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 confidence in the the arrogance and ignorance of these world leaders who had to walk past it and it was a, a world that was spinning and inside every border it just said people live here people live here because mm -hmm. the simple reality is that as covid demonstrated and as you know th this was the wettest summer in record in the top half of europe or potato europe as people call it and the bottom half of europe or tomato europe uh, was on fire and the Weather and germs do not need passports. Mm -hmm. So the fact that these decisions are still being made of in isolated terms of national identity is laughably futile. It is, and I try, I, you know, when I think about narrative and identity, I, this is one of the things that I find most flummoxing. Like looking at the pandemic, it happened all over the world, and in this country it happened in all 50 states, and yet each state had different COVID policies. and. Yet, we're all, I mean, we're, none of us are immune because of the borders within which we reside. Uh, and it's really interesting that um, borders and difference and the identities that we're so very attached to, for a lot of reasons, are more important than survival. Mm. Uh, it's interesting that we see those things as the mechanism for survival rather than like actual survival. And I don't even know how we begin to get past that. As writers and readers, we often talk about the importance of storytelling and how it engenders empathy and so on. And I believe in all of that. But clearly, storytelling is not enough because there are plenty of people who are telling very important stories that hopefully can move us forward and it's not creating change. So what do we do when story isn't enough? But it's, I think then it's, it's that deep internal motivation cause, and, and stories are ultimately the drive for why you do anything and nationalism is a story. Mm -hmm. And that, you're, that you know, you've been forgotten is a story. And even, uh, we were talking about this, but even taking like for example the 2016 election campaign when coal mining was like the poster child of the forgotten industries and people on the left were like, well yeah, because coal mining is destroying the planet. And then people on the right were like, you know, but those people lost their jobs. And even, you know, just a, a very simple storytelling mechanism could have been, rather than you're irrelevant now, thank you, that mission is finished, we need you over here. Mm -hmm. And that wouldn't have made those people feel forgotten. Um, it's, so I think it's, it's that deep-rooted why. And, and stories do, they get under there. Because, the, you know, everything that we know about everything about ourselves is a story in some ways. But can we still tell stories that, that, that uh, pull rather than push? I hope so. I, I definitely think that's the goal. But we'll see. Yes, yeah, we will. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I think I see a zeitgeist shift happening already. Where? In people much younger than us. Yeah, I, you know, I, that, yes, I'm deeply encouraged by young people. I spent the weekend with my nieces up in Boston, and well, yesterday and the day before. And um, they're amazing. They're 11 and 13, and they know everything. 
they know they know everything, <laughs> but the optimism that they have, the agility of their minds, the way that they can evolve, and, and so quickly, like I saw one of my nieces two months ago, I see her all the time, and she's kind of like a different person now. She was a tomboy two months ago, yeah. and now she had a manicure. And she kept talking like this, like, you know, the guy on TikTok with the long nails? And she was just like, so, does it eat or not? And I was like, let me Google this first. Yeah. Uh, but it's interesting to see, like, she, they're both very passionate about the things that they believe in, that normal children believe in, but also they have an awareness of the world. They yes. have an awareness of politics, not just an awareness, they care very much. And I do find that encouraging. Well, quick, quick survey. Who here was born before social media? Oh, hell yes. Okay? <laughs> right? A lot of these kids that, 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 that we're talking about, my, my children are five and it. They're, they're not. And yes, there's all sorts of ills that come from that. But it means that another way of looking at this is that everybody can see what everybody else is doing everywhere. And we, we used to think in terms of, you know, village mentality, which grew to cities and then city-states, and then that grew to nations, and that's like your identity. And I think, really, that's, it is that the, the you know, the, the notion of the overview effect that it's actually, like, these dry bits of land on this, this bowl is, is really the borders that, that we know of. And, I, I, you know, I think people understand that in a very different way. And, you know, I think Stephen Hawking once joked that the only way there's going to be peace on Earth is if there's an alien invasion when we all get together against a common enemy. And maybe that is sort of what's happening and needs to happen, but that alien, that common invader, is the weather. Yes, or the, uh, the aliens that I keep reading about. Um. <laughs> or actual aliens, yeah. I thought that turned out to be a kick. Yes, I, you know, I don't, I hope. I, I you know, and I, I hate saying the words I hope because it's just like I don't have a lot of optimism that these things can happen. I suspect that if actual aliens descended upon us, we would be like, states rights, let's yeah. figure this out. Yeah. My, uh, my here dad. in Nevada, yeah. we are <laughs> simply going to welcome the aliens in, and then yeah. here my, in uh, whatever, in New Mexico, uh, we're going to blow them up with nuclear weapons as if the air yeah. from New Mexico won't float over Nevada. Yeah. Uh, I think my, it's My dad joked once that uh, aliens probably drive past Earth and lock their doors. <laughs> yeah, we are that planet. Uh, <laughs> I, I, We're still in our infancy. We are. I'm, we are. And okay. I think it's important to remember that. The hope and optimism are different. Uh, are you optimistic about the, the future of global uh, civilization? No. <laughs> I want to be. I, I very be. much want to be. I just... COVID really was very haunting I, for me and I think for many people because... Why? When it started, I, mean, I thought... I told my wife pack two weeks, let's go to LA. And I genuinely thought everyone in the country would stay home for two weeks, that could. And the virus would go away because it didn't have any hosts to incubate we, within. We had that window. And we did, and it didn't happen. It's, we're still dealing with it now, and in fact, it's back on the rise. And that's so alarming, and I think that is the canary in the coal mine for future calamity. And as a writer, I often feel impotent because it's just words, but I try as often as I can to reiterate what's at stake, why this matters, that we cannot ignore it. And so I, I really try to be optimistic, but I, I struggle with it. It's funny you bring up COVID there, because one of the, the instigating factors for writing this book was an interaction I had with uh, an old lady in Belfast, when we, we en accidentally ended up back there because we were traveling when COVID happened. We'd just come from Japan. Nobody there really was expecting it to be as big a thing as it was. This old lady, I saw her at the light, she had bags of shopping, and I said, oh, are you getting ready for the lockdown coming? She's like, yeah. I was like, do you think it'll be long? And she was in her 80s, and she said, love, I was around during the war, and I thought this might have been like that because Belfast was heavily bombed during the war. And, uh, and she says, but it's not, because back then, we all tried to see how we could help, but look around, everybody's just trying to see what they can get away with. And it really just sat with me, it was like, mm -hmm. where, in the course of, what, 75 years, where do we so radically change from 
a community-based existence to an individual-based existence. And that, it, that has been one of the things I've been thinking. And you know, there's all sorts of things at play there, like the idea of, of um, that you are the center of the world. But also, you know, by no uh, complete coincidence, around the 1950s, advertisers worked out that individuals make better customers if they're in competition with their neighbors. And just this idea of community started to slowly, slowly, slowly be eroded away. And I think what gives me optimism is, especially after COVID, the thing that people actually missed was each other. And I think we're starting to wake up to the importance of community again. Yes, and I will say COVID, for all of the negative things that it has engendered, a lot of mutual aid really became quite robust and remains so. And that has been very heartening to me. I think oftentimes we look upward for assistance. We look to seats of power. And in reality, in most communities, it was people looking to each other that really allowed for some mechanisms of support for people without support, for people without families, for people without means. And you know, I think that as we move forward, and as we think about these kinds of very big and often unanswerable questions, we can look to what's actually happening. Right. Who's actually doing the work? Because there are a lot of people in every community who are doing all kinds of important generative, supportive work, and they rarely get credit for it. Um, or somebody discovers them and then pretends that they had some sort of key thing to do with it. But community support and community labor happens all of the time and you know you see it with free little libraries and community refrigerators and all kinds of things and I think it's important to focus on that and in the ways that we can engage with those efforts not try to lead them but find out who's doing the work and then ask how can I be of service and I hope that more of us can do that yeah. to try and start from the bottom up instead of looking yeah. to for example a president and expecting her or him to do anything actually useful. Yeah. It is, it's that, what that old lady said, it was like, how can I help rather than what can I get away with? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a, I think it needs to be a global mindset shift that the astronaut um, Nicole Scott once said, was like, how do we go from being passengers on this cruise ship to being the crew? And it's, that's an interesting way to put it. It's like, we all have a job to do. Mm -hmm. We all have a role to play. But to, to that point, you know, the, was this, the way to judge a civilization is by how they treat its most vulnerable members. Yes. But let's talk about your book for a second, because it's, so that's coming out next week? Or yes. the week after? October 10th. Um, opinions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, is it a surprise to you that this, it, it is, this sort of vessel through which you started writing and that you've, you've ended up with a, a collection of opinions <sighs> that you were willing to share with the world? I'm always willing to share my opinions. <laughs> uh, it's surprising in that I think of myself primarily as a fiction writer and literally no one else does. Um, <laughs> and I did not start with writing nonfiction. I fell into it and yet I have persisted. And it's very, you know, it's just all surprising. But I was thinking about, like, putting together, I'm really working on another book, but I, and the very long journey to finish that book, I was like, I should probably publish something. <laughs> and I thought about the reality. I've been creatively stuck for a few years now. It's just a fucking desert in there. And yet, I have written quite a lot. And so I st started going through my hard drive and I was like, oh, actually, I, it's, maybe this is why I haven't been able to finish a book. And I realized that all of it was opinions and engaging with the world as it is and also the world as I would love to see it and what it should be. And it felt like a great opportunity to bring some of that work together. And you know, it's interesting and a bit uncomfortable to read it all at once because it's like, ooh, I do that a lot. You know, it shows you not only what you do well, but also the kinds of um, weaknesses mm -hmm. in your writing and thinking. Um, 
And so it's been also a bit humbling, and that's okay. Uh, one can always use a bit of humility. But it, you know, I'm curious to see how people will engage and, of course, share their own opinions. And I look forward to that. Did it have any patterns emerged that uh, you didn't expect to see when you put that whole collection together? Yeah, yes. So my background in terms of nonfiction is actually in rhetoric and technical communication. And so everything I do, there's a strategy. A lot of people think it's emotional utterance and like vibes, but <laughs> it's not. And so I have this tendency to like list all of the terrible things happening in the world. And you know, it's like just using accumulation to make a point and who Lord, I was like, girl, you do that shit a lot. <laughs> Let's try something else for the next one. Yeah. And so, you know, I saw that pattern. And at the same time, it clearly needs to continue to be said over yeah. and over. So it's not just sort of a, a tick in my writing. It's mm. that I feel like we do need these reminders of what's going on and what's at stake. And unfortunately, horrific things continue to happen over and over and over again. I can't tell you the number of mass shootings that I've had to write about or the number of um, extrajudicial murders by police. Yeah. And clearly we need to continue to remind ourselves of why these things happen and why nothing changes. So um, on the one hand, it's like, ooh, and on the other, the other hand, it's, it's like, yeah, it kind of has to happen. So that was interesting. You know, and it might be possibly a silly question, but you do understand the importance of you doing this and the impact that it actually has out there in the world and, and maybe even giving other people the strength to, to continue to question as well. Do you give yourself the, the moment to reflect on the, the difference that it is making? No, <laughs> never, <laughs> never. I mean, and I know that you said in an interview once that you don't really dwell on success at all. You're on to the next thing. You're looking ahead, not backward. And I tend to be the same way, probably for pathological reasons. But, you know, I rarely allow myself to acknowledge the reach or impact of my work because I always think, oh, that can't possibly be real. And then I have pretty fair evidence that perhaps I'm wrong. Um, and that can be overwhelming, and I don't take it for granted. It's not that I want to dismiss it. It just is a bit surreal, even not, now. Not so much, you know, allowing yourself to be pat in the back, but just be like, yes, okay, this is making a difference, and almost using it as fuel to, to project when it feels futile. I, so I try to enjoy that. Not even, enjoy isn't the word. I try to I absorb it. Um, yes. And I do know, like, in certain arenas, yes, the work has an impact, um, especially with um, doctors who, not in a large number, but my, one of my books, Hunger, is being taught in a lot of medical schools. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and that was one of my hopes, not necessarily that it would be taught in medical schools, but that doctors would read it and realize that fat people are people who deserve health care. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's so simple. It's so sad that that's noteworthy, but, you know, I remember once, and I write about this in Hunger, I went to the doctor because I had strep throat, and the first thing he wrote on my chart was obese. And I was like, my throat is not fat, thank you very much. My throat is riddled with bacteria. <laughs> Can I please have some penicillin? Um, so, you know, when I see things like that, mm -hmm. and I know that it won't reach every doctor, or nurse, or other healthcare practitioner, but it will reach some. That is very meaningful, and of course, other writers I know who work in this space also get to appreciate that and know our work is being read. And I think oftentimes we look for wholesale change, and one thing writing has taught me is that perhaps we just look to the individual, again, like thinking about what we can do as individuals and that we can reach individuals, because once you start to reach enough individuals, you start to see that maybe there can be change, and there is change. So I do try to appreciate that as often as I can. Yeah, I suppose for, for me, the, the moments that I, I enjoy most is when I'm in a bookshop buying a book for myself, and I, I'll see a kid sitting on the floor thumbing through the book and obviously enjoying it and having no idea who I am uh, and that I, that I see that. It's, like that. it's just that, yes, this is, it's, it's, something is resonating in here, and that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's powerful. My dad was a teacher, and he often talks about the 
I suppose the the realization for him that so many so many teachers do not understand how important they actually are, mm -hmm. and perhaps if they did, they might continue to do some of the things they're doing, but maybe not do some of the things that they're doing as well. So you know that I suppose that temperature check is is. Uh, a decent thing to do, just uh, almost like a heat-seeking missile to, to correct every once in a while. And, and I know that we're, we're sort of getting on the time and we want to leave some questions, but mm -hmm. um, the, when I was reading through the PDF of your book, so the, the last line of, of my book, it says, uh, for there is wild beauty in this life on earth and hope wherever you look for it. And Roxanne sent through the PDF of her book and, and uh, one of the essays is The Case Against Hope. And so I was like, <laughs> all right, here we go. Yes. But, <laughs> but as I said, I think we are two, um, two parts of uh, a necessary range that, mm -hmm. that humans need. Yes, and I think that range is important because we see what monocultural approaches have done and they don't work. I think that there is room for all kinds of perspective and there, there is always a seat at the table for a range of voices and it, it's really important to remember that and it speaks to how you don't have to be right you just have to say something and hopefully say something meaningful um, right or wrong is really besides the point it's really more what kinds of things does this inspire in people or what does it make them think about and what does it make them go do afterward and I find that kind of thinking often very helpful in addition to secretly believing that I'm right <laughs> <laughs> or that you're better. <laughs> well, that goes without saying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I really don't think that at all. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, uh, so for, for my book, I was trying to think, what is, what is the one thing that I could, would hope for this book in the world? And it's somewhere in that combination of maybe trying to encourage people to think in terms of decisions they make and uh, interactions they have with being better rather than being right, being better over worse rather than being right over wrong. And you know, there's the, uh, uh, something I heard once that, that said, be gentle with everyone for we all carry a great weight. And I, and I do think about that. And ultimately, helping with that shift of getting away from what can I get away with to how can we help. But for, maybe for opinions, putting those all out, it, would you have, to use that word again, hope of how it will impact, what, what difference it might make? What I hope, what I hope for with opinions is not that is you know the people. Most you've said hope the <laughs> most ever, I'm so the most sorry. I ever I will. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want people to realize that everyone has a right to articulate their understanding of the world and can share their perspective and do so hopefully in a thoughtful manner. So many times the question I'm asked is, where can I find my voice and it's already there, you have it. You just have to give yourself permission to use it. And that was really hard for me, and I think that was why I turned to fiction well before I ever turned to nonfiction. It would never occur to me that I could share an opinion and, and that it would be okay, right or wrong, or somewhere in between, that I could do it, that it, the world would not come to an end if I was wrong. And part of what helped with that, of course, is seeing lots of people shared truly just egregious opinions all the time. And I'm like, if he has the confidence to do that, <laughs> surely I can do slightly less damage. But I hope that people just recognize that they should give themselves the permission they need to use their voice in whatever way they see fit, whether it's writing or making art or protest or some combination thereof. Um, because I think more of us, and especially more people who live in marginalized bodies, should take it upon ourselves to do that because, you know, coming back to stories, everyone has an interesting story and oftentimes people with some sort of platform will say that, you know, I want to give voice to the voiceless, which is not something anyone should ever say. Really, you know, how do we just encourage everyone to use the voice they already have? People don't need to have their voice given to them, truly, not ever but oftentimes they just need permission, they need mm -hmm. encouragement, and mm -hmm. I hope people take that and also find some of the writing entertaining. Yeah, what, what I do, and I also realize for having, you know, it was the first essay I've written since art school, writing's hard, man. It's, it's, it can be, it yeah. can be, I mean. Uh, like you have to say what you mean. kicking my ass right now. <laughs> um, whereas, you know, I can get away with drawing 
mediocre pictures in a, in a speedy manner and, and they're like it's vague enough that it might mean this or, or it might mean that but you can you know it's a lot more poetic but that being that specific really challenges you to understand exactly how it is that you feel about yourself mm -hmm. which Absolutely. was a, a highly highly useful exercise um, so yeah this is Roxanne and I up here hoping to change the world um, <laughs> For the same reasons, with different yes, means, absolutely. Uh, and I think we're going to open it up for a few minutes of questions before um, I'm going to sign books. Roxanne's is not out yet, so uh, you. I think they have it, but if they don't, I won't sign it. Okay. <laughs> oh, they have. Okay, so we're both signing. I believe so. Okay, fantastic. We're both sending. I'm just trying to get you off the hook there. Oh, thanks. Um, I'm good. But if anybody does have a question, we got a few minutes now. If anybody wants to do it, you're going to have to be a brave soul. So I don't know how this is being moderated. Oh, yeah, we got one right there. Thank you so, so much, and especially for uh, your work on uh, Roxanne Bad Feminist. Um, um, I really appreciate the space between ideals and practice, and I feel you've path, uh, paved a path. Uh, one question I have is with regards to power, and you know, with more and more audiences growing um, that enable marginalized voices to have a stage, to be visible, to be heard. Um, there comes a responsibility, and how do you deal with that kind of power? How do, you, how do you enable that the doors are not shut behind those who've made the cut? Um, and have your perspectives on that changed over the last couple of years, and are there uh, new strategies you're um, working on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I will start with how my understanding or my connection to power has evolved over the course of my career. For a long time it was very difficult for me to believe I could ever have power or that I did have power or reach and there are lots of reasons for that but the deeper I get into my career, the more I recognize that I'm not serving anything by suggesting that I don't have power, uh, because I do, and if you do, it shouldn't be wasted or, or squandered or hoarded. And so I think that too much power, we see what happens when anyone has too much power. It's a disaster. And so it, the most important thing I think I do with my power is create opportunities for other writers to share their writing with the world and to be paid an equitable and fair wage for that writing. And I do that in lots of different ways. Oftentimes I ask a company, you know, if you want to work with me, then you also need to pay for, you know, five fellowships or um, you need to give these four writers a lot of money so that they can write a little book for you and things like that. Uh, and the reality is that most people, most very successful writers can do that. They just don't. And um, it's not that I'm a saint, but it's very, it's exciting to be the first to do something like the first two times. By the third and 20th time, it's disgusting like how is this still a thing and the thing that really pushed me over the edge when I was invited to write World of Wakanda for Marvel it never occurred to me that I was going to be the first black woman to lead a Marvel title because it was 2018 and then when the papers started reporting on that I was genuinely shocked I just thought how is this possible I mean there are plenty of amazing black women writing comic books I, I, I don't write comic books at all like how on earth would I be the go-to when all of these women exist. And that's when I really sort of amped up my efforts because you don't want to be the only one in the room ever. That's a very lonely thing. But more importantly, what does that say about you that you're willing to do that? And so I've tried to hold myself accountable in that way and really rethink what it means to be the first or the only. And I know for damn sure I'm never the last. And so, um, that's what I do. And also I still teach, but not for much longer. <laughs> <laughs> the babies are yeah, special. Uh, hi, uh, wonderful uh, discussion, thank you. Um, when I think, about, I think about a lot of this stuff a lot, and it's, it, this is really nice, and one of the things that I think about in terms of a reframe is like um, this idea of uh, the way that we interact with the world, and this is sort of setting aside the idea of sort of systemic racism and bigotry and stuff. 
but just the way that we interface, right? And the idea of classification and the limitations of language and how it gets in the way, both in the terms of, of our own expectations and how we should conform and also in the ways that we see somebody and sort of armor ourselves against who they, we think they are. This comes up a lot in like my sexuality and stuff. So it's like people are always trying to put a label on it. And in reality, all these things, we, we sort of have this conversation, they're all spectrums. And you know, when we think about something like sexuality and gender, we say they're spectrums, but then you know, we, don't, we don't really honor that. And when we think about sexuality in particular as being a spectrum, uh, and our, the conversations are around primarily gender, which is a spectrum, the whole thing becomes absurd, right? It's a paradox. And so to me, this, the language that we're using is actually getting in the way of progress. And as you as writers, I would love to hear, because I'm coming at this from a scientist thinking about things in continuity, and I would love to hear your perspective on all of this in the way that language is involved and whether or not any of this really holds any water for you. Well, I, th I think being an artist primarily before a writer, I don't have that the exact linear uh, structure and limitation of language. Um, and, and as opposed to what I was saying was like writing is hard, is like you have to be very, very specific. Um, the, and there are probably are ways and, and techniques of doing this when writing like poetry. For example, you set out the seeds so that they are put together in the, in the minds of, of one human being. But you know, anything, anything that you read is a co-creation because you're putting it together in your own mind, even if it's a linear sentence. So is it language that's, that's the, is, is the limitation here or is it the, the cultural structure that we have that is setting up the preconceived notions of those limitations? Yes, I, I would agree. I, I don't know that language is always a problem. It's what people do with that language. For some people, labels and language are restrictive. And oftentimes, people can feel limited because you can only be understood in this narrow way. But there are many people for whom language is useful because it gives voice to who they are in ways that they had not previously been able to experience. It gives them a sort of home, a place to belong, a sense of identity. And so I try to think of language and those kinds of issues in terms of how do we use it in ways that are useful to people and don't limit them and don't categorize them and sort of force them to stay in that category. And there are no easy answers because I think people tend to prefer things that are simple and clearly delineated and people, you know, that's why I think so many people struggle with gender as a spectrum because we have only known the binary for so long even though the binary has never really been the reality of things. Um, and it's just trying to overcome those natural prejudices that are unnatural prejudices really that people have and recognizing that language isn't really the problem, it's the thinking behind the language. The, syst the systems don't fit the the, the reality in mm. some ways, but also language is always evolving. Yes. Uh, and we make up words. You know, there's words that enter the, the dictionary every year and those words didn't exist, so somebody made them up. And words are discarded. And so to, to, I think it's a healthy thing to think of is like language is a, a tool we use to communicate how we feel inside with as little distortion as possible. And it changes as we change. So mm. I find hope in that. Yes. Well, thank you all so thank much you. for joining us.